Welcome to So Very Wrong About Games. Believe it or not, it is a board gaming podcast where we talk about board games. I believe it is safe to never believe anything you say. It is. That is a safe thing. Today in Canada is Remembrance Day. In the United States, it is Veterans Day, which always makes me think when we play these historical war games to always show some respect while you're playing them and realize what they represent. During this show today, we're going to talk about games we played this week, news and why it doesn't matter, and our feature game this week, which is Cloud Spire by Chip Theory Games. Not involved in this week's episode is an introduction of the two co-hosts. My name is Michael Walker. Oh, I stand corrected. My apologies. I am here with my great friend, Mark Bigney. How are you doing today, Mark? I'm very well. How are you? Mark, what did you play this week? <laughs> played mm-hmm. Wavelength. I've been looking forward to Wavelength for a while. This was a review copy that was sent to us by the publishers. And I just want to get my quick reactions right out of the way because actually it's a lot of the things that I played this week are going to have echoes later on when we do our feature review of Cloudspire. Some of this was because I went and played games in the aftermath of Cloudspire and some of this was just because I'd been thinking about these things by when we were playing Cloudspire. Wavelength is very much the same kind of structure of code names where there's a clue giver and a whole bunch of people trying to guess things in two teams. It's a competitive game with two teams. The difference, one of the differences that in Wavelength, the clue giver switches from round to round. So it has one of the benefits of something like, say, Decrypto, whereby everyone gets to both give clues and receive clues. And honestly, it is one of those games where, and I mean this is incredibly high praise, you can tell that the designers knew exactly the kind of social experience they wanted to elicit, and they designed a game that elicits that perfectly. This is one of the most carefully crafted gaming experiences I've had in a very long while. And to give a sense of what the game is about... You have this beautiful wheel, which is this big, chunky, visually impressive toy that will randomly spit out a section, uh, a pie section of a rainbow shape, more or less. So imagine a, a, a semicircle and it'll spit out a proper spectrum. And your job as a clue giver or the psychic is to get people to turn a knob such that they are able to indicate the correct section of the circle that you want. All this is hidden to them, though, and all the only tools that you have a psychic to you is a spectrum, so from bad to good, hot to cold, walker to big knee, for example. I don't think that card is in there. Maybe they should have an expansion there. And then you give them a clue. And based on that clue, they're supposed to say, okay, well, where does this go? The example that they give in the of the Kickstarter campaign, which is very good, is it's hot to cold, and the section of the wheel is slightly more to the left than it is to the right, but it's not all the way to the left. The clue's coffee. And so then the group is like, well, coffee's very hot, but it's not as hot as a burning sun. But then why would they give coffee? Clearly, you can't be measuring this on an absolute Kelvin scale, because then coffee would still be very, very close to the right. And so you then have this discussion, you finally hit the knob. And it has this great moment of reveal because, again, the physicality of this wheel is so beautiful. You then get to slide away the plastic partition and you get to see where the knob is in relation to the spectrum that you were trying to go for. It's a marvelous, marvelous reveal. You know those moments of tension in code names where you wait for the clue giver to then put those little cardboard pieces over, over the cards? It's like that, but ten times better and with a marvelous little toy. And again, the designers wanted to make you feel like you were psychic, like you had shared this this mental bond. And you get to feel incredibly clever and like you're thinking on, and I'm, I'm sorry, but this is the only way to put it, thinking on the same wavelength. Haha. That was not even intended to be humorous. It's just the way, the best way to express it. And it was great. It was a marvelous experience. The only criticism I have of it is that it was too short. You play to 10 points, and you can score up to 4 points per round, and so it tends to you tend to knock out a game extremely quickly, or maybe we were just lucky in our first couple of playings and we, we happen to be on, on the right page. It is very much the kind of party game experience where you and I want, where you get to trash talk the other teams, you get to try to lead people down a false path because all the discussion is public, it's got moments of drama, it's got moments of elation and success. Anyway, as a social experience, I think Wavelength is absolutely without peer in this uh, kind of sphere, and it's very much what I was hoping it was going to be. The only criticism I have at this point, other than the fact that it's too short, is that the marvelous physicality of the wheel is great, but... If you see pictures of the wheel, you'll understand this. It is very easy when attempting to do the big reveal and you slide away the partition to accidentally rotate the wheel that is actually determining where the spectrum is. And obviously that's a big no-no. So you have to remind everybody, grip it by the base, grip it by the base. And of course that starts to sound dirty after you repeat it for the 17th time. And people often tend to forget. So, so far every game I've played, someone has either come close to to notching it over or has actually notched it over. And that's a bit awkward. And it's a little bit of a blemish on a beautiful thing. 
I really enjoyed Way of Life. I can't wait to show it to you. And I really do think that the designers uh, deserve credit for producing exactly the kind of experience that they were trying to elicit. And that was Wavelength. Oh, I definitely wanted to give it a try. Like when you said that you switch clue givers every time, I sort of was like hesitant, right? Because, you know. Why is that? Well, just because part of code names being the code giver, it's nice to have like sort of a strategy. It's like, okay, I'm going to, you know, knock off these, you know, two groups of four words and then work on these ones that are harder. Like you look at your words and you sort of like plan out your thing. And then it's that's, I feel that that's part of the game. And if it's, you know, that's gone, then maybe. But I'm this, now that I see it's nothing to do with words at all, it's like this completely different thing. I definitely want to give it a try. It, it does have the advantage of just being able to spread out that different kind of experience. Being a clue giver is different from trying to guess something. And you're right that that aspect of trying to go down a list and systematically. Speaking as a clue giver myself, I've never been a very good clue giver in code names. I don't know that I've ever gotten to the la- that level of four-dimensional chess, of seeing past the third, fourth clue or what have you. But I will say that in the context of Wavelength, another benefit that it has is you're not limited to – you don't have to care about spelling like you do in – Letter jam, and you don't have to worry about what constitutes one word like you do in just one or in code names. The 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 other problem, though, and you you actually reminded me, is the guidelines for what a good clue is, or what an acceptable clue is. I'm not a huge fan of. They say that it's supposed to be a single idea. And naturally, as somebody who studied metaphysics, uh, the history of metaphysics in the West, what constitutes a single idea is actually not as simple as you might think. And in fact, their examples lead me to some degree of confusion. A specific example that they have in the rule book is, don't make it a compound of two clues. Because then you start worrying about, well, this clue is on this end of the spectrum, this, this clue is on the other end of the spectrum, let's triangulate between them. But the example they give is, a good clue might be texting while driving. To which my response is, well, that's clearly two things. That's obviously two things conjoined into one. And the counterexample that they give as a bad clue is uh, texting while driving a Honda Civic. It's like, well, how is that more of two clues than... I mean, yes, arguably you can break that down into three constituent concepts if you really wanted to. Arguably four if you wanted to separate Honda and Civic. But anyway, uh, the, the point is that there's a certain degree of ambiguity. And I was sufficiently not confident that I'd internalized specifically what they wanted in terms of clues. That I just read that paragraph to the table. And immediately, with my, without my indicating anything, a couple of people were like, wait a minute, that's nonsense. And so we, we got an idea of, of how to proceed. And there were, no, there were never any moments as you sometimes get in just one or in code names where someone gives out a clue or someone does something like, nope, that's wrong, you you failed. But it was a little less clean than I'd like. And so suffice to say, I have yet to encounter one of these games, and we're, here we're comparing very different games, where I felt that the rules for acceptability were completely cast iron. So well, Letter Jam got close, but again, then you have to spell everything correctly, which, which some people just completely aren't willing to do. Anyhow, maybe this will go away with further plays of wavelength. wavelength. We will keep you apprised. I kept on my, you know, quest of playing a lot of the same games over and over again. A lot of, you know, uh, gateway games. Carcassonne more, but I did say, I did get to play Carcassonne Gold Rush. And it does very, very interesting things on on the Carcassonne template. You're, uh, you know, building these mountains with, you know, mines in them. And you're putting out these tokens. And you have less meeples to put out. But instead of meeples, you have this tent. So you're either putting out a meeple or you're working with this tent. So you're moving this tent from off the board onto the board or you're taking these tokens off the board where your tent is, right? So every time you put down a mountain tile, it has these little gold nuggets on it. And if it has three gold nuggets, you put these three counters on it. And then at the end of the game, there's going to be these little gold nugget symbols on the counters and they just give you straight up points. And if you finish the little mountain range that the gold nuggets are on, you get all of the tokens. So that's fairly interesting. And then instead of getting uh, points like a city, you get points, you just add up all the little gold nugget tokens that are on the map pieces and you get that. And then the twist they do on the roads, it's actually railroads. So you're connecting these railroads to all the towns. And the twist is there that they're only worth one point like they are in Carcassonne. But if there's a single train and only a single train on the track, then they're each worth two points. So you can really mess with people by throwing an extra train on their track or whatever there. And the other very interesting thing is, uh, I guess the example would be cloisters in Carcassonne. Instead of cloisters, they have like cities. It's a single tile. You put the city down and it has a number of tracks exiting from it. And you're going to get three points per track that goes to another city. So as in, if it loops around back to the city, then that's just one track. So, but if they go out to three different cities, then you'll get nine points. And I thought that was pretty neat as well. And that's Carcassonne Gold Rush. I love the Carcassonne variants. 
Yeah, there's a set. There's a. I, I played. A, I think it's South America one or or maybe. Amazon. Maybe Amazon. Yeah, there is. There is so many years. So many years ago, I played it. I know someone that has it, so I'm gonna grab that next. I remember it being interesting. I remember not liking it very much. You like, it's like you're sort of like under a time limit, like this boat sailing down, and you have to like sort of play ahead of the boat. You know, you have to keep ahead of it or something. I have to remember how to play it, but I'll. Since I'm going through these again, trying to uh, you know bring bring the the level of gaming up, we'll see how that goes. Well, that reminds me vaguely of probably one of my favorite of the historical variants, namely the New World, where there's this uh, settler that that marches west, and there are whole rules about what you can do west of the settler, and most of the actions east of the settler, and 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 all these other things. Anyway, it was beautiful. I also like seeing the different art styles of the different Carcassonne. We actually played vanilla Carcassonne recently, and I was reminded that I prefer Carcassonne with, with a smaller number of players because I think that ups the interactivity, whereby you really do care about muscling in on a specific other player's thing. It also became clear, it was a really good illustration, I think, of our discussion a while ago about competitiveness and competition, because it became clear uh, very shortly on through the game that people were playing this kind of sort of as a co-op. People were drawing tiles and explicitly saying, okay, where can I put this so that it doesn't really hurt anybody? And specifically placing it so it's like, oh, okay, I see you're building a city. I'll add to, I'll add this city tile to your city because I don't have a city that's currently under construction. And that was very helpful that they had vocalized those because it managed, it helped manage to flick a switch in my thinking. Oh, I'm not, I'm not having a competitive experience here. This isn't really working in the same way as a game normally is. And that helped me not care about people behaving in ways that I thought were counter to the kind of social expectations of a game. And it helped me understand what was going on, and so it was fine. Now, I kept complaining, mind you, but the complaints were motivated instead by the fact that I just complain all the time sarcastically as a general rule. It it took the teeth out of, at least from my perspective, the teeth out of the complaints once I knew how people were approaching the game. And so that was very helpful. But I, I love, there's something so visually appealing about most tile-laying games, just watching the game state evolve and when the art is as charming as Carcassonne is it was it was it was a joy even on just that simple level yeah it's just the same sort of thing like a village building game sort of like you know Caverna or Agricola when you're like sort of building something out in front of you there's just something about those types of games that just you know appeals to people tiling is great it is all right Mark talked about last week talked about unmatched Battle of Legends and I finally got to play it I'm probably going to say all the same things he did because I don't listen to when he talks about games that I haven't played. That's a good policy. But let's talk about hand management in this game and how huge it is and how there's a character that lets you make your opponent discard cards and she gets to to draw lots of cards. And and it's a very interesting game about just making sure you have the right cards in your hand at the right time. I think the playing time is fantastic for that type of game. And I think if it gets a little bit of legs, it might actually go places. Yeah, it's strange because a lot of other games that you've played that you've not enjoyed, I'm thinking specifically of Battlecon Exceed. You talked about how, oh, it's just, you know, you either draw the cards you need or you don't, or what have you. There's a certain amount of card throughput that I want out of games of this ilk. Now, it can be complicated. Well, not complicated. It can be involved like Battlecon Exceed. You can do things to draw more cards or fewer cards, but there's a certain amount of throughput that you're guaranteed. Or it could just be something bone simple like, for example, Sakura Arms. You're going to draw two cards at the end of your turn. Simple. But in the case of Unmatched Battle of Legends, the amount of cards that you draw is so vanishingly small compared to the rest of your other actions. And they're, like, you can effectively skip a turn to draw all of two cards in a game where your hand, hand size is nominally seven. And yeah, then, yes, there are lots of effects. You, you play the Medusa, who's very good at making people discard cards, but there are lots of cards that make people discard cards and a very small number of cards that let you draw more. So I really did feel in every game that I've played, in every character that I've played, even the ones that are nominally even a little bit better at card throughput, I'm just starved for cards all the time. Sometimes that's an enjoyable experience, but in the context of a tactical battle game where it's it ought to be about positioning and knowing when to do what, I'd rather have a little bit less feeling like I was just desperate to draw more all the time. So yeah, that's my chief criticism of Unmatched Battle of Legends. I'm glad you enjoyed it, though. You're absolutely right. The playing time is marvelous. Yeah, it's only got to play it once and i thought the way you were moving around the board and keeping out of you know range and stuff on such a small board and in such a uh, i want to say basic game because that makes it sound like it's simple it's not you know overly simple but just the fact that you know the positioning does matter 
And like I said, the playing time is great. And the fact that the next expansion is uh, Robin Hood and Bigfoot, you know, how how can you go wrong? Yeah, I don't know how I feel about that. And that, <laughs> oh, I've gone too far. And uh, yeah, that is Unmatched Battle of Legends, Volume 1. Who, who made that? Sorry, I didn't write that in for some reason. Restoration Games. Restoration Games. And it's a redevelopment of stuff that Rob Davio did quite a while ago, Epic Duels. Played the Menace Among Us again. I talked about this last week. This is yet another attempt to do Battlestar Galactica Light in 45 minutes, where you're playing cards secretly to a queue, and so you try to figure out who played the bad cards. First game I played, I was the bad guy, and I made a bad call right near the beginning of the game and got outed. In this game, I was the bad guy again, but this time I was a little bit clever, and I was able... I felt a bit dirty doing it, Walker, because let me tell you what I did specifically in the Menace Among Us. There's an old saw... And I really think it's false in pretty much every game. And usually you hear it in the context of playing werewolf, which is they are talking too much. Clearly, they're not trustworthy. And in the context of werewolf, I mostly think it's false. In the context of games like The Resistance and better games, it's even more false because the way you win as the good guys in The Resistance is by talking, by getting information to the the system. Getting the most information you can. Precisely, by making sure that everyone's on the same page. Can a spy introduce a false narrative? Sure. But it is less likely to survive if everyone is engaging with it in dialogue. It's one of the reasons why you're not very good at the resistance, because for some reason, you're a talkative, engaging guy, but the moment a social deduction game comes, you just clam right up for reasons passing understanding. I do not understand. It's weird. Someday we're going to have to do some therapy on you, figure out why, why, why that is. But in The Menace Among Us, there was this key turning point where somebody was accusing me, he had figured out that I had engaged in suspicious behavior. And I felt so filthy and slimy doing it, but I reached into my lizard brain just for survival. And I thought back to all the times that I'd been falsely accused in games before. And I basically deployed a version of, he's talking too much, therefore he must be untrustworthy. And the table bought it, and I felt bad. <laughs> so we, we ended up bringing him instead of bringing me. Bringing me. And there was just this sort of deflated sigh as everyone saw that we had we had we had incarcerated someone who was innocent, and uh, I didn't feel terribly good about it. But you know what? I'll take the win. <laughs> <laughs> but, but what I hoped about the Menace Among Us was that it was worth the slightly janky setup and slightly janky teardown because everybody gets a unique deck consisting of two different unique deck elements, and so sorting out all the cards is a bit of a pain. Very much like Dominion, you know, it's it's compared to Dominion in terms of the setup and teardown, although not gameplay. And I really liked it. I thought it was thoroughly enjoyable. It's clever. It gets done what it wants gets done very economically. There's a fair amount of opportunity to keep yourself hidden as a as a bad guy or pick your spots. There's a certain amount of hand management. Sometimes as the as a member of the good team you're forced to do terrible things, which is something that I'm kind of okay with sometimes so long as it doesn't introduce too much noise. And it moves along at a great clip. And so for people who don't like the intensity of the resistance but are getting a little bit tired about the random noise of Secret Hitler, I think The Menace Among Us is is kind of sort of in a good middle spot for that. And so I'm going to keep it around. It's a shame that it's a big box because for quick social deduction experiences, I'd rather have something small that I can toss in my bag. And The Menace Among Us is, is a big box full of cards. But it's great. And uh, it... it it does get a little bit of mileage out of its components. The way you trigger a, vo- a vote to break somebody is you're expected to snatch a laser pistol off the table. So there's this two-piece. It's not a particularly impressive piece of component, but it, it's relatively large, and it sits there on the table, and sometimes people just start staring at it, wondering if anyone's going to, metaphorically speaking, pull the trigger and call a vote. So I'm very pleased with The Menace Among Us. I'm probably going to be keeping it in rotation, and I look forward to more experiences. I'd like to know what it feels like to be a good guy in The Menace Among Us. That, I think, is the last bit of data that I need to, to sort of round up my opinion. The last thing I'm going to talk about is just Baron Park. The fact that there's going to be expansion soon, and when we played it this week, I just thought about all the elements that this expansion is going to, you know, bring in and just, you know, sort of play out in my head, you know, while we're playing normal Baron Park, how that would work. Because in the expansion, you're going to be able to play these gigantic green pieces, but you have to give up two pieces to play them. And there's going to be a monorail that runs through, and you're going to go up to five map pieces instead of four. And I'm just really looking forward to trying out, you know, this new, you know, multi, you know, I love these module expansions where it has all these, you know, new things that you can add. Really? I hate module type expansions. 
I just I like it because there, you can use piecemeal, right? And if, if there's some parts you don't like, when you have an expansion and it adds a whole bunch of things and they make it mandatory and there's like this one little thing you don't like, then you're almost obligated to use it all. Or if it's a module, it's like, okay, well, I like that one, I like that one. Or you can slowly introduce them to your group instead of, you know, loading them all on. Or if there's some new players, you can play, you know, vanilla game with, you know, one of a small module that just sort of, you know, you like your, per, you know, personally. So yeah, if the non-modular expansion has bad stuff in it, obviously, it is. It would be better if it had been modular so you could take out the bad stuff. But all in all, I like it when a game has a little bit more editorial direction and I feel like I'm playing a designed experience and the designer knew what they were doing rather than throwing a whole bunch of stuff at the wall. On that topic, Vindication. Walker, are you ready to go long? I'm ready. I have many feels about Vindication. I have a lot of very conflicted feels about Vindication. Vindication was a successfully kickstarted game. It was originally called Epoch the Awakening, which uh, I think is it hits all the right buttons for a terrible title. First of all, it has the colon with subtitle Epoch colon the Awakening, and it doesn't mean anything. Like what? What does that? What does that mean? It's the awakening of an epoch. It's the dawn of a new age. Okay, what was the old age? What's the new age? What's happening here? So Vindication. Vindication was very highly recommended to me by a number of people of our acquaintance. And I didn't put a whole lot of stock into it. I didn't get a whole lot of detail about it, primarily because when they recommended it to me, I I do what I always do, which is I say, how many listeners do you have? I don't really give any credence to anybody unless they have an audience that's larger than us. And that's why I get all my game recommendations from Joe Rogan and from Howard Stern. So... That, that, that's a sane attitude towards life, right? 100%. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's why I don't listen to my parents' advice anymore because they, I mean, their podcasts exactly. do not have many listeners at all. Know, brutal. Yeah, yeah, it's sad. Anyway, what, what was I talking about? Yeah, Vindication. So Vindication is, so nominally, it is a fantasy adventure game where you wander around doing fantasy adventure game types of things. You recruit allies. You get stuff. You kill monsters. In point of fact, Vindication is an engine builder. Which just so far so fine. Like, I don't like if it's if it's a, 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 a an overland adventure game. It doesn't have to feel like anything in particular. It doesn't have to feel like prophecy. It doesn't have to feel like ta- talisman. That's okay. I'm fine with that. It doesn't have to be a tactical combat game like Assault on Doomrock. That's all right. But it's a bad engine builder, Walker. It's it's a pretty bad one because effectively what you need to do is get your cubes to where they want to be. There are six attributes. Three primary ones, three secondary ones. And the way you get secondary attributes is by combining two different primary ones. It's all along a color wheel. If you want a green secondary attribute, well, then you need one blue and one yellow primary attribute. They turn into one green. Fine. That's fine. It's but, a color quest. Sure. No, and honestly, that part I have no, no problem with. When I, when I made that realization, when I said, oh, this is just an engine builder game. That's okay. That's fine. I had no problem with that. The trick is... Then the question is, so how, what are you actually doing mechanically over the course of the game? So if there's a disconnect between the theme and, and what's actually going on under the hood, that's okay. But what, what are we doing in point of fact? What are the primary ways that we interact with what's going on under the hood? Well, you kind of have almost a, a tableau builder element to it in that you have these different companions that you, those are the easiest ones to get at the start. You might get other things called traits. You might have other things, get relics, whatever. There's a whole bunch of different th- cards you can get that help you either convert cubes or do something else. But the most common thing you're going to do, especially at the start of the game, is, okay, I have this cube, I put it on my companion, my companion says I get to put two cubes somewhere else. Okay, there we go, I'm on my way, I can use those two cubes to buy something else, or if I get two cubes over here, I combine them into something else. Yeah, so far it's a Euro game. But these cards, you get them in some of the most lazy, random Euro game ways imaginable. There is, by default, one card face up in every stack. And when you go buy a card, you either buy the one that's face up on the stack, or you buy, you top deck and you get the, the, the one top down of the, the, the stack. There's no drafting, there's no display, there's no tableau, there's no nothing else. And I, in the one game that I played, I locked into an engine. I blindly pulled a follower that basically synergized with everything else and said, oh, okay, I can pump this, no problem. Imagine if you were playing a game of Terraforming Mars or any other tableau builder where the card volume throughput was reduced by about a, uh, by about nine-tenths and all of it was just from a single card face-up or top decking. That's honestly what it felt like. And it's not that you're crippled if you don't get a good engine going, because you're always able to convert cubes in a very, very inefficient way. But looking back on who did what more efficiently, it was honestly not because they had an overarching goal to get to a place that they needed to get to, but it's because they stumbled upon cards that were good at conversion. On the topic of multiple different 
expansions. Vindication was a very successful Kickstarter, so it's got about half a dozen modules built into the base game. None of them really address that fundamental issue. One of them puts the game into overdrive and gives you a fourth action available on your turn that is more or less more powerful than all of your other three actions. But everyone gets access to that. And honestly, I'm not sure. I'm I'm curious to try some of them, maybe. Because despite the fact that I felt it was a relatively poor engine builder, it was a reasonably quick, reasonably enjoyable experience. And a lot of other people really like Vindication. It's just once I saw what was going on, I, I couldn't remain very enamored of it from a design perspective. The component decisions are also deeply, deeply puzzling. There are these giant miniatures that serve no purpose. We're talking about four or five inch tall miniatures. One of them is the start player marker. Fully five of them serve only to function in number one, one of the add-on modules. And number two, they don't serve any gameplay purpose at all. They're just, this is the guild you're working towards. They they serve Kickstarter stretch goals. Precisely. That is exactly what they serve. And that, that's mystifying. And on top of that, the character pieces are these very cool looking metal medallions, but they're kind of hard to differentiate from a distance. And the metal medallions are slotted into very, very cheap looking plastic standee bases that aren't designed for the metal medallions. And so you end up with these floppy metal medallions because they don't, they're not held tightly by the, the plastic bases. Uh. It's bizarre. On top of that, as a final objection, I sincerely think, and I've commented on this before, that the designers don't know what the word vindication means, because it's not a game nominally. The theme of the game, the game is pretty themeless. The gameplay is very, very themeless, honestly. It's like, I have, this companion is, uh, you know, Fana Ruha, the the spirit caller of the Django bits, or whatever. But really, it's just, oh, she gives me yellow cubes. All right. Nominally, you're trying to regain your lost honor, but you just do this by getting stuff. Like, you're just acquiring stuff. It's like, oh, I've got more friends. I've got more mystical artifacts. I've got more traits, whatever. That's not a really solid redemptive arc. And that's what the game is. It's redemption. It's not vindication. Vindication means that you were proven to be have, have been right all along. So the trappings don't match the gameplay. The gameplay isn't particularly inspired. And it's linked to a relatively random influx of resources. And it's got a whole bunch of components that are bizarre or mysterious uh, or completely unnecessary. But at the end of the day, it's quick. It's relatively inoffensive, but it's really random and not particularly interesting. So I'll probably play it another couple of times. Local, locals love it. I'm semi-interested to try it because ever since, was it called Kingsgate? So you said it was like an adventure game, like with a twist. And we played that other adventure game where the twist was sort of like resource gathering, but you're out killing monsters. Is that... City of Kings. I You're talking King. about the City of Kings. I knew Kings was in there. Yeah, you were right. All right. All right. So, yeah. So, just like City of Kings is it's like a really cool twist on, you know, the normal adventuring thing. And this one, you're not just going out killing monsters. You're actually doing like a resource gathering cool like cool thing. It's like, okay, well, this town is, you know, going under pestilence or, you know, you need to get this much water or this much stone. And so, you're like gathering resources while you're killing these monsters. And... For the mon- on just a quick topic of the monsters, I think that was the one of the most interesting new methods of doing monsters I've ever seen. Where it's just this generic card where you could just you know think up whatever monster it was. It's like this is the Brotherhood of the Dead, and right, or you could it could be almost anything. And I think I really enjoyed how they did that part of the game. Yeah, but the City of Kings, despite the fact that it's it's basically a Euro management game, the monsters were threatening. They would come and kill you, and you had to be careful. In Vindication, there are monsters to kill, but they do the thing that we've been complaining about recently. They just stand around waiting to die. Waiting you to just kill. go and kill until, them. Until you have the right resources. And then it's like, okay, now yeah. now I'm ready. Can you come, come just over here? You have to convert. Sword, can, you, can you slide right there? Thank you. Slide on the thing. Oh. You have to convert your... You have to convert your yellow cubes and your red cubes into orange cubes, and you use the orange cubes to go kill monsters. And they just stand there waiting patiently until they're they're ready to until die. Until their number comes up. Uh, yes. Now serving number 102. Yes. Gotcha. And yeah. honestly, since since you're talking about the thematic hook of the City of Kings, about how it allowed you to play a little bit with your imagination, I commented this in the context of City of Kings. A listener commented they've been having a great time recently with Shadows of Malice, the Jim Felly design. And Shadows of Malice is really one of the better thematic experiences you can have in this particular space, precisely because it gives you room to imagine what's going on, and it's a unique take on the genre, and it knows precisely 
when to give you representative art and when it needs to step back. And so whatever you're doing in this in Shadows of Malice, you don't end up feel feel like you're participating in some kind of spreadsheet. In Mindication, there's beautiful art and overdone components all day long, and it's lovely to look at, sometimes awkward to manipulate, uh, to, to, to interact with by virtue of, you know, the cards are a strange shape. It makes them harder to shuffle. Anyway, whatever. They, they had a vision, but it doesn't end up feeling like much of anything. And so... It was it was a strange experience. Vindication has its feet in many different spheres, and I don't think it successfully pulls off really any of them. But I am willing to give some of the expansion modules a try, although they're, they're very divisive. A lot of fans think that some of them are great, and a lot of fans think that none of them are any good at all, and that the best experience is just the, the, the base game. So I'm curious to see that at least, and I'm sure we'll have no difficulty finding players, because a lot of people really love Vindication. And those are the games we played this week. Now, on to the news and why it doesn't matter. So, there is a new game coming out by Fantasy Flight Games called Fallout Shelter the Board Game. <laughs> and I bring it up only because it seems, it does seem semi interesting. They use all the art, you know, where you see all the, you know, the pup boy, you know, the pit boy, pit boy cartoon art. So, it's using all that art and you're, you're in charge of your own little vault and, you know, you're doing stuff and you're, you know, killing guys and you're feeding your people and, it, it, you know, Let's hope that it's semi interesting enough to play. It's a fine enough. I mean, it's a fine enough premise, honestly. But it's it's the board game version of a mobile game, and it was the worst kind of mobile game. You know, the the, the cravenly capitalistic pay for more moves kind of. You need to interact with it every couple of hours with push notifications, but you can't do more than five minutes of stuff at a time because then you run out of whatever resource, so you have to go buy more. Ugh. I can't believe they're making board games off of these these kind of cash grab mobile games now. It was just a promotional hook for Fallout Four. So oh, I we'll, say, I say, oh, the follow, there's an actual phone game called Fallout Shelter. I didn't yeah, know yeah, yeah. Oh. oh, no, this is the board game adaptation of a oh, mobile game called no. Fallout Shelter. Okay, okay, I pull it all back. <laughs> I regret it all. Some games never really go out of print for very long. And even though it's not one of my favorite games, I'm very happy to report that Wiz War is going to be in its ninth edition. <laughs> Steve Jackson Games has acquired the rights to Wiz War, and they plan on publishing a version possibly sometime in 2020, possibly later. And my first reaction when I read this story actually was, wait, haven't they already published a version of Wiz War? I just assume that any publisher that's been around for a while has had their hands on the Wiz War license at some point or another. But sure enough, no, this is the first time that Steve Jackson Games has ever had their access to Wiz War. It, so. It's their turn. It's their turn, exactly. <laughs> Exactly. <clears throat> so more was more to be coming. <laughs> so there's a game coming out by Madagot Games by the same designer of In- Inish, and it's supposed to be Inish in Space. It's uh, supposedly might be called might be called Beyond the Gates. So I read a little bit into it. it looks like it's going to hopefully it'll be a little interesting. Hopefully it'll be what Inish what we wanted Inish to be. We'll have to wait and see. We are both so deeply conflicted about Inish. I know. It's the kind of thing where I you know, I wanted Inish to be good so bad, and I enjoyed a fair number of plays, but I had this weird yeah. arc of yeah. not liking it, then liking it, then not liking it yeah, again. Yeah, you read the rules, and you think it's going to be great, and you're playing yeah. it, and you think it's going to be great, and then it has it slowly turned. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So suffice to say that it was close enough to greatness that I'm very curious to see what Kristen Martinez comes up with, and I am perfectly willing to send any game into space. So, 100%. And on that same topic, it was in the same in the same block. The fact they were talking about a little bit more about Kemet and the one point five, and the new rule book. And I'm just want to put it out there that they should do a big box Kemet big box <laughs> with the rule book in it, so we can fit all these expansions and the game into one box. I, I can fit all the expansions in there. Oh, can you? I, th- I only. I think I. I've, you got to di- first. You got to ditch the insert. Oh, I haven't ditched the insert. Oh, sure, sure, sure. All right, that's the problem. Ditch the insert. It'll all fit. All right. On the topic of big boxes, we reported merrily along that the Hansa Teutonica big box was supposed to be at Spiel, but it was not. It was not to be found at Spiel, and the publisher now says that the Hansa Teutonica big box is going to be published in early 2020. So, more news to follow. We don't. We still don't know exactly what's going to be in there, whether it's actually going to be a big box. I hope it's not too much of a big box, because on the topic of fitting everything in the box, you can fit all the Hansa Teutonica contents into the small box, so I hope they go with that, but we'll see. That's right, yeah, I did actually get to go back. I looked at my box. I do have everything, and it does all fit. All right, D-E-I, Divide et Impura, which translates, because I just said that awfully, I'm sure, uh, translates into Divide and Rule. It's by... I, I encourage everyone to go to iTunes and give us a negative rating based on our Latin pronunciation. There you go. It's by Ludus Magnus Studio, the same guys who did Sina Tempura, 
which is also terribly pronounced. <laughs> but anyway, I from the little that I played of Cena Tempora, I'm enjoying it a li- I'm enjoying it quite a bit. This is back to dudes on a map, you know, risk style, moving, you know, little units and mechs around and multiple people at once. I haven't had a chance to look at the rulebook closely, but I haven't seen a game like this in a while, and I'm hoping it's it's going to be very interesting. And that's D-E-I, Divide et Empira. Lastly, on Kickstarter, there's a fantastic game coming out. Sometimes I'm, I'm you know, I... How do you uh, know it's Fantastic Walker? Well, because I'm excited about it, Mark. <laughs> sometimes I'm looking up things online to put into our new segment. And sometimes, you know, okay, well... That doesn't mean you have to hype them. You can just mention them I as wanna, notes of interest. I, well, because I'm, a, I'm genuinely interested this time. This time okay. That's semi-okay. And I'll include sure. that. I, you know, well, that caught my eye. I'll talk about that. Tell us about this fantastic thing but that you this, haven't played, this Walker. This is this, this giant round plastic behemoth thing that represents a planet and you're drilling down into the core and you're putting these mining drones out and these big bases and pipes that, you know, you drill down into. It's called Titan Mark. Titan, the the planet mining drilling game. That's not what it's called, but it's called Titan. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it should have a... T- uh, uh, I wouldn't blame it for having a subtitle because there's already a very famous game called Titan, so... Yeah, I was very... I was surprised that it didn't have a, you know, a, eh, you know it, slash. This it's, is by, it's been a while and they have different audiences, so I guess it's okay. This is by Holy Grail Games, designed by Matthew Podvin. You know, I, I'm doing awesome here. I'm, I'm probably... N- I'm just nailing all these enunciations. Crushing it. Crush, crush. Sparta. Pfft. All right. Anyway, take a look at it. It's on Kickstarter. It's got probably about 10 days left after you you, you hear this podcast. And it is re- very, so far, very reminiscent of Soul, Last Days of a Star, where, you know, you're building all these buildings, but anyone can use them. You engage a certain color, and they all engage type thing. So it's got some reminiscent things of Soul, and I'm hoping that it plays out the same. I'm going to read the rule book a little more closely, and I'll get back to you. Finally... 2019 has been a very bad year for the hobby in terms of losing brilliant and influential game designers. We've already seen the loss of Richard Berg. We've already seen the loss of Francis Tresham. And it looks like one of my favorite war game designers, Chad Jensen, might not be with us for very much longer. Uh, Chad Jensen has been fighting cancer for a while. We commented back before when his GoFundMe was launched. Uh, He's now been sent home, and apparently from word from his family is that he's probably not going to be around for too much longer. There was an announcement of this in the Combat Commander forums. We wish the very best to him and his family, and I'm certainly going to be enjoying his output for years to come. And he was a tribute to the hobby, and it is a shame that he's had to go through these health challenges, and we give our very best to Chad Jensen. That is the news and why it does matter. Now on to our feature game which is Cloudspire by Chip Theory Games. So Chip Theory Games got their start publishing a game called Haplomachus. We talked a little bit about this before. Haplomachus is a kind of vaguely sort of Heroescape-esque kind of deal where you've got units and you it's a dice test and you smash people against each other. I found it inoffensive but not particularly engaging. But their next output, Too Many Bones, we've talked a lot about on the podcast. It's a very, very novel take on the fantasy adventure genre and sort of tactical combat and a lot of unit customization. They put out a, a smaller design called Triplock, which we have not played. It's kind of a puzzly thing, and so we didn't seek it out. And Cloudspire is their newest output. Chip Theory Games is, is defined very much by their approach to components as much as anything else. They like neoprene mats. They like thick, heavy poker chips. They like custom dice. And they hate cardboards because they, they're just, they're distaste for anything derived from the noble tree is such that even the cards are plastic. So if you want to play the game underwater, you can. It'll get awkward, but you can do that. Everything is waterproof and weird. This was designed by Josh and Adam Carlson, who are the people who designed Haplomachus and Too Many Bones. But this time they're jo- uh, joined by Josh Wilgus, who was credited with some design work in Undertow, which was the last Too Many Bones expansion that was, that's was that been released. Uh, and he also had input on a lot of other Too Many Bones expansion content, like 40 Days in Daylor, and a number of other things. So this is the first time he's given primary credit on a new game design from Chip Theory Games. And it was put out after a successful Kickstarter not too long ago. So, Walker, why don't you give us an unhelpful summary about what one does in Cloudspire? I will. Keywords. Cloudspire is a tower defense puzzle game where you're, you, it's much like any other tower defense game, keywords, where you're building up all of these units, which have all different abilities and 
they're mindlessly heading out to the other opponent's base keywords. And then you're also building all these towers along the way on the path that they have to go through. And hopefully that they, you know, knock down the health keywords of the units before they get to your base. And if your base gets to zero, then you're out of the game. And that's Cloudspire. So first of all, I think we need to address something that you were remiss in not mentioning. And that is how many keywords there are in the game. Is there? There are a fair number, I think. I I, I'm surprised it. you didn't notice. So we, we commented on this a couple of weeks ago when we played it for the first time. Playing Cloudspire for the first time, or even playing a new faction for the first time, or even playing a faction that you've played three times before, is very much characterized by spending a lot of time reading about how various keywords work. Just as an example, it's not always this bad, but this is as bad as it gets. There's one faction called the Heirs that have an entire sub-mechanism called the Elfenkaze. These are a type of unit that do not behave like any other unit in the game. They operate with different timing restrictions and with different freedoms than other units have. And then they have a different special ability that no other unit has. And these are all defined by the conjunction of two different keywords that are on some chips. What a normal rulebook would do is, you know, devote a special section to say, like, okay, here's how these things work and walk you through it in detail. And indeed, they've had to do this in an online fact because nobody, I, I wasn't able to parse very clearly how these things work just by reading the included documentation. But even setting all that aside, every unit in Cloudspire has a special keyword that range from situationally occasionally good to I'm going to ruin all your opponent's plans. And when you multiply that with the number of keywords that special landmark tiles have, multiply that with the special keywords that every base has when you're building up your base, there's a lot of special stuff going on in Cloudspire. 100%. Let's just go into what, what they say the theme is, because I actually looked, and there's like a whole paragraph, Mark, like a whole like four sentences of theme. It's very exciting. I'm sorry I left that out when I first explained the I know. Well, order. apparently, Mark, there's this thing called Source, and it's what you know makes all of these islands float in the air. And for some reason, there's, you know, a little bit less of it now. And now all of these different islands that have been floating around are now crashing into each other. It's actually a trenchant political commentary on fossil fuel industry. <laughs> Which is now having all of these, you know, nations, now they have to fight over, you know, because they can't work together, apparently, to, you know, the last remaining bit of source. Like I said, it's political or, commentary. Exactly. What do you want? It's fantastic. So, so now they're fighting over the source. So this is the main part, the main uh, currency of this game. So you get a certain amount of it. So you're planning out how you're going to spend it. You've already talked about the components. Well, why don't you talk about what you like about them? Uh, you can play them underwater, Mark. <laughs> Walker, I, I said you kept objecting. So no, we talked talk about the good about, points. We, no, what we talked. About I'm it. giving you this layup. We we can put the towers out, right? And like you said, uh, towers can be upgraded, much like any tower defense. You know, they're gonna you know shoot at units as they go by. They all have a certain defense, and they're all gonna roll a certain amount of dice to do damage. And you can quickly see at a glance what kind of what kind of uh, uh, upgrades they have because you stack these chips underneath. So that was the one good part of the components. This is the first time I felt that Chip Theory Games' emphasis on chips actually paid off in the in the form of the spires because the spire upgrades are different chips and you just stack them up. And so, yeah, I can look over the table and see what a given spire could do. In the past instances, and indeed sometimes in Cloud Spire, it's just a chip on top of red health stacks, which is exactly what Assault on Doomrock does and a lot of other games do. It's just tokens under another token. I felt it could have been any lower cost, easier to manipulate material, but at least in the context of the spires, I think it works great. You can eyeball a spire from clear across the table, and it's very, very handy in that sense. Now, there's no, there's no question that all the components are nice. Now, whether or not they all increase gameplay value. That's something that we can talk about, or I'm sure we're going to talk about later. Well, I'd like to talk about it now, but apparently we're supposed to talk no, no. about the good things first and then the bad things later, no, independent well, of how no, conceptually... We're, we're supposed to fight about that every time we talk. Right, so a lot of these things you need to shuffle. You're supposed to shuffle these giant neoprene mats. Every how day. do you shuffle neoprene? Exactly. I also, still don't know how you shuffle neoprene. A little little neoprene mats, so you have to shuffle those as well. How do you shuffle neoprene? I want them to tell me. And then, you know... We had the the dice, the chip stack that that I had that exploded wasn't ones that I was supposed to shuffle, but you know there you know there are there are some chip stacks that you need to shuffle, so that's a, also a pain. I also still have difficulty with chip theory games cards. If you grip a deck of cards, you have to be very careful to not have all the cards in the middle fly out and engage an unintentional fifty-two card pickup. M mostly though, 
Uh, my key objection to the components of Too Many Bones, uh, sorry, of both Too Many Bones and Cloudspire has nothing to do with how overpriced they are, although they are overpriced. I think you could have marketed this game at a th- possibly even a third of its actual price if you'd had economy in mind, and it so would have been just as functional. It's that the key information on minions and heroes is almost impossible to read. It's these tiny, tiny numbers on these chips. It's a question of pure graphic design. You can eyeball a spire from clear across the table, but if I want to find out how a minion operates, I need to get it right in front of my face, and that's not an eyesight problem. That's because the numbers are super tiny. Now, normally... Just just to, uh, for context in terms of quality of components, I normally don't tend to see possible upgrades. A lot of people, they look at a game, and it's, it's a gift, right? Especially for publishers. And they say, okay, well, those coins could be metal. These things could be improved. Uh, you could enlarge in these and change the shape of these. I don't have really good sense for that. I, in fact, have a, a much more prominent sense of when the game is overproduced. It's like, this is not functional. It would have been more functional if it were cheaper. And I, I, I get that a lot with Cloudspire and other Chip Theory Games games. I just, I wanted, even just a simple uh, a, a improvement of graphic design would have made me a lot happier with the state of the components. I felt so it actually gave you that tower defense feel. Like, as you're playing it, you felt as though, you know, the, the, the spires that you put out mattered and they actually did reduce, you know, the units as they came in. They were actually useful and the, and the, the way you put them up, I thought was very interesting as well. Every turn you have two possible uses for that currency called source. You can upgrade your base, which gives you access to special powers, and each of the special powers are radically different for each of the four or five factions included in the game. And they will also contribute towards the victory conditions if your gate is not destroyed. If the game goes the full distance, four rounds, it's whoever has the highest sum of health plus number of base increases. Alternately, with that same currency, you can build spires, which are also expensive and will also do lots of damage if you place them correctly. That trade-off, that strategic trade-off about how to use your currency and the way the spires worked, I thought was great. And there aren't a whole lot of good tower defense games, which is strange because it's such a well-established video game genre. And usually in video game genres, you you, you tend to get some pretty good video game adaptations. Xenoshift Onslaught feels like a tower defense game sometimes. Dragon Valley, I think, is a pretty good uh, tower defense game. But in terms of just that element of that trade-off of when to build towers, how much to spend on towers versus upgrades, and how the towers work, I think that part is great. I think it's it's a very, very engaging part, and I like those trade-offs, and it's well done. All right, so something you touched on very quickly there was it's... uh... End game is very easy to track and to see what's going on. Like you said, it's just, you know, your health of your gate plus the upgrades is your score for the end of the game. So it's easy just to look over and see what where people are at and, you know, just to gauge what you need to do to try to be, you know, effective. Next, I have every faction plays very differently. Yes. There's four different factions in the box. Apparently, there's a fifth that I haven't seen if uh, for an expansion, but they all play very differently. And not do they do not only do they play differently than each other. Much like Too Many Bones, they have little mini paths that you take when you play them. Like, there's so much that a faction can do that there's no way you can do all of it during a game. You sort of say, okay, I want to, you know, do this building that affects that unit, and that's what I'm going to do this game. Because you really have no time to do much more than that. It's true. But we commented on this before. I prefer this level of asymmetry in a cooperative game rather than competitive experience. Partially because it is borderline impossible to even on a repeated play, to internalize everything that your faction can do and everything that your opponent's faction can do. And so if it's just a function of managing what your special abilities can do and then you get to do it and your friends say, wow, that was cool, and then start thinking about how they can combo off that, that I think is great player interaction and is a a very good way to let the asymmetry shine. If it's instead the case that even after several plays, it just feels a little bit arbitrary because you cannot possibly track all the keywords that are flying around on, on the board, it ends up feeling a little bit too chaotic and random for my tastes. But yes, the asymmetry is delicious. There is a movement bonus. Like, your guys have a movement value. They move around the map, and you're here, you have heroes that you can manipulate as well. But there's, sometimes they get a movement bonus, i.e. they move very well in trees or mountains. And I thought that was a very interesting way to do things, the way they just, you know, put a little symbol of the terrain type, and, you know, you're good for certain well little is the right word uh, yes it's, it's super true. tiny and sh- so shall we talk about minion movement not yet not yet okay 
All right. I'll have more to say about this topic later. That's right. Then there's sort of, we didn't get into this much, but we sort of talked about path manipulation. A lot of computer uh, tower defense games is, you know, changing the path in which the mindless minions move and making them go through the towers twice or zigzag through them. We could see where it was coming up in the puzzle, in the cooperative games or the solo games. But just the fact that it is possible and, and a different, you know, strategy that you can take. I thought that was an interesting thing. Absolutely. It's, it's the restrictions can make it a little bit hard to do it too easily, which is probably for the best. You can't just send the, send the minions going off into the wild blue yonder too easily. But the, the fact that you can try to manipulate the geography that will have a very, very important ripple effects is a good aspect of control in the game. All right. The very last thing I just sort of touched on it, the fact that there is the versus mode where you play one, uh, sorry, two to four players. There's a co-op mode and there's a solo mode. I think that's just very interesting that they've included everything in the box, and it's and it's uh, they, from what I read, it, it's very interesting. Well, well, from what you read, we tried the co-op mode. We did. There's, I've tried the solo mode as well, and you can't deny that a lot of effort was put into it. There's an entire book of scenarios for the solo mode. There's also a separate book of scenarios for the co-op mode. And the rules are relatively straightforward. There's not a whole lot of confusion about what the AI does in whatever circumstances, which is which is for the best. But they're not really to my taste. This is just a purely personal preference thing. They're very, very, very puzzly. They're very much a question of, okay, here you are under very straightened circumstances. Here's a very, very strong force coming in your face. You need to know the right combination of things to do with a very small amount of resources to get the job done. And the reason why I don't like that is, and again, this is, this is just pure personal preference. If I'm playing a solo game, I would like it to feel like the competitive game as much as possible. I would like it to emulate that same thing and have the same kind of trade-offs. But the moment you start stripping away mechanisms from the, the competitive experience or adding new sub-mechanisms, and some of the scenarios do either or both, I feel like I'm doing a radically different thing and playing a, a very carefully curated puzzle where there's only one right answer, rather than allowing me to engage in the kind of tactical response or cut and thrust that I would in a slightly more competitive environment. And so it wasn't really to my taste. All right. So that's what all I have for positive comments or notes for now. Let's go to the things that I didn't like. So let's start this off by, if you actually want to play Cloud Spire. <laughs> Which I mean, like, just not, you know, like, fumble your way through it and say, you know, I got through it. If you want to, like, sit down and, and, and play competitively or know what you're doing or or pay, play to be competitive, these are things you need to know. You need to know because you're going to stack your units up. Either they're going to be stacked together or they're going to go individually. So you need to know how to stack your units up. You need to know all of the different key words that are all on your units and all of your opponents, which are about 11 or more per side because some of the chips are either double-sided two different units or the unit plus it's upgraded uh version which has different keywords you need to sort of figure out where these units are going to meet on the map so you have to sort of know how far your opponent is roughly going to move and how far you're going to move and where the spires are going to be when that's going to happen you have to know how to use your hero and make him the most effective he can be because the minions move mindlessly towards each other's base, but the hero, you can move wherever you want. You need to know how all your buildings, all your building upgrades work and how they interact with your units and how, and which ones, which buildings to build to, you know, most improve the certain strategy that you're using in this game. And not only do you need to know all of this, you need to know, how your opponent's buildings work and how they're going to counteract this strategy that you've picked. So these are all the things that you need to know at every given time while you're playing Cloud Spire. So Cloud Spire feels an awful lot like a tower defense game much of the time. But in terms of what you're actually doing most of the time, it feels a little bit more like it's trying to emulate some of the aspects of MOBA games. MOBA games being where you have heroes and minions, and the minions just rush forward mindlessly and do their thing, and then heroes are dodging in and out, in and, out and doing various things. And I love MOBA board games. I adore Guards of Atlantis. I love Rum and Bone Second Tide. In fact, I played Rum and Bone Second Tide just a couple days ago because I wanted to play a good MOBA game at, in the aftermath of playing Cloud Spire. I even like Load, and Load is super derivative. I mean, it it is what it is. So the minions march forward mindlessly, and 
This is the part where managing the game becomes a little bit cumbersome because when they're just moving along a path, everything's fine. If they have additional movement capabilities, if they can move into forests or mountains or what have you, then things start to get a little bit obnoxious. The rules are relatively simple, but mathing out the actual consequences of how an individual unit is going to act in any given moment can be a little bit obnoxious, just a little bit obnoxious. But repeat that calculation dozens, literally dozens of times over the course of the game, and it gets tiresome. I stopped taking units with special movement capabilities precisely for that reason, because I didn't want to bother. Overwhelmingly speaking, the two things that you're going to be doing over the course of a game of Cloud Spire, and I encourage you to contradict me if this is wrong, is number one, staring down at a reference sheet, trying to figure, trying to look up a special ability, whether it's yours, the environments, or your opponents. Or number two, managing a mindless menu. That's, that's the overwhelming percentage of what you're going to be doing over the course of the time. The fun decisions. Do I spend money on upgrades? Do I spend money on towers? What kind of towers do I want? What kind of units do I want, even? Sometimes that can be engaging. How do I move my hero to maximize their effectiveness? You know, stuff like this. The bread and butter of your, of your standard tactical game constitutes the minority of the actual playing time. Most of the time, it's going to be, okay, this minion moves ahead two. Uh, this minion moves ahead three. Does it displace this thing? No, it, it doesn't. So I guess it moves over here. Yes, yes, it does. Okay, my turn's done. All right, your turn. This guy moves four. He moves up here, blah, blah, blah. Then when they meet in the middle, there's a bit of a log jam, very much like a MOBA. They, 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 they clash in the center. It's like, okay, I attack you for two. You can't attack for one remove the chips. Okay, your turn. Okay, I attack you for two. You can't attack for two. Okay, it's dead. You get two source. Okay, this is the new minion here. All right, whatever. And it's just mechanical. It's I on it, worse than mechanical. I felt like if I were going to be smart, I should be able to, the moment I purchase a minion, calculate where it's going to be 10 turns from now, no exaggeration, where it's going to be 10 movements from now, so I can see where the log gem is going to happen and sort of, sort of try to game out the overall geography of the game. But quite frankly, the mental strain was not something that I wanted to do, and so I ended up just buying units that I thought were cool, and then they smash into each other. And that part of the game I found overwhelmingly tedious and occasionally frustrating. All those little bits. Oh, if only the log gem had happened in this space, one space forward instead of one space back. If only I had done two damage on that one turn instead of one, then a lot of things would have been different. If I'd had one more source at that crucial juncture, whatever. And these are in theory calculable, but in practice not. And so... Given that that's the overwhelming experience of Cloudspire, I wonder what kind of experience they were trying to model, honestly. I don't. I felt as though not all the factions were completely balanced. Some seemed to play a lot easier and seemed a little more, you know, to you know, more useful and more, you know, freewheeling than others. Then there was the event cards. Oh dear lord! Right, and you, like you said, that all of this tedium got in the way of having fun. And then when you did have fun, these event cards came up. And, and, and bash that fun. So today I went and read through all the event cards just because I thought maybe, 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 Mark, we just drew poorly, but they don't. They all seem to, uh, either limit source, you know, your currency, like either, you know, say you lose it or make you spend it on something else or destroy the spires that you've put out there. So, they all seem to, or make, remember the one that, <clears throat> sorry, it was called food shortage. Yes, I remember And all these really cool units that you, that you, you're buying all start with one health. Fantastic. Boy, that's fun. There's so little randomness in Cloudspire. Most of the randomness, most of the chaos is emergent from, again, the fact that you cannot calculate out where this landlock is going to be because I move two spaces a turn and you move three. And okay, well, absent other factors, where are we going to meet up? And I don't know what unit you're buying, so I don't know where the, the melee is going to be. But the actual randomness consists of a small number of relatively low variance dice rolls for the spires. That part is fine. I've got no objections to that whatsoever. And these event cards, you will draw three event cards over the course of the game. And it's almost as though the designers of Cloudspire says, okay, we have these three points of randomness. We have to make sure they're as consequential as possible because it's only going to happen three times in a two-hour game. And they're ridiculous. They're not fun. And they're going to whack people differentially. For example... The food shortage that you talk about, not only is it the case that all your units just have one hit point, basically what that means is, oh, are you in the lead? Congratulations, you're going to stay in the lead because there's not going to be enough movement involved in terms of the actual victory conditions. You can play like a monkey and be an idiot on that turn. What does it matter? All the minions only have one health anyway. They're not going to be able to do much damage to you. 
every, everything's going to die real quick. Or congratulations, that interesting strategic trade-off you've been doing to invest in spires so you can defend your base against everyone that's coming and predating on you. Now we're just going to destroy them. There's an event card that says your spires just die. They, it's a little more complicated than that, but the net effect is that all the spires on the board die. There's no way to keep them alive given the constraints of the game. Well, I just want to go a little bit further. Now. Not only do they die, but they're then once again replaced with a landmark tile, which then makes it even harder to get them back again. Right. And some of the landmarks are easier to deal with and some of them are harder to deal with. That part, of, again, that's another part of variance, I'm sorry, in addition to the event cards and the dice rolls. And that part is okay. Some of them are are, are, are hostile monsters that are going to come and, and mangle you for a little bit. Some of them are just portals that are not particularly useful to you. That part is okay. That's an acceptable level of variance for me. But in the last game we were playing, it was a multiplayer game. We wanted to try the multiplayer, even though I had zero faith in how the multiplayer was going to go. After the second or third round, I actually felt like, oh, this isn't working out as badly as I thought. Because because all your minions are mindless, you don't get to choose where they go. You have to declare at the top of the round who they're going to march towards. And if you think about how that's going to work in a three-player game, it's about as, as degenerate as you might think. But... I had a pretty hefty lead coming into the last round. I figured, okay, this is going to be all right. I'd invested in Spires to defend myself because I knew I was in the lead, and I knew that both Walker and Louie were going to come after me. But then we drew the event that says your Spires are kaput. And as a result of this, I've got two people marching on me. I have to decide who to march on. Well, I'm going to march on who's on second place, I guess, because they're probably the bigger threat. Well, congratulations. Whoever was in third place coming to that round wins. I could have predicted that at the top of the round, and sure enough, that's precisely what happened. The leader gets knocked down by two people, and the leader can only damage one of them, so there you go. That's it. Four-player with teams is probably the way to go. If you want to do multiplayer, I can only imagine the chaos that four-player free-for-all would be. Uh, but oh, just the event cards were egregiously awful. All right, yep, I have that. Best plays at only two-player. The price, ridiculously high. It's like $110 or something foolish like that. Your units do straight damage. Whereas the spires, you have to roll dice for. I just thought this was yet another mechanism that was not really needed, which also goes into the fact that there's two different kinds of currency. So there's two different kinds of damage, and there's two different kinds of currency. There's the source that you do to upgrade all your buildings and your towers, and then when that's all done, you get another type of currency in which you buy units with. Why you needed two, I don't know. I didn't mind that because I, I actually felt a game that made it made the game simpler. If you just had the one currency, namely source, you then have to trade off upgrading your base, building spires, and buying units. As it is, you only have to trade off, uh, trade off between two of those things, and then you have this other currency that's just for buying units. It helps streamline and simplify things. I, I, agree, I, 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 don't, I, I agree with you, but I just don't understand. For some whatever reason, it just, it just rubbed me the wrong way. That's fair. Uh, the factions, I, like the the abilities of the factions are interesting, but just the factions themselves, I did not find very interesting at all. Was like birds and and ghosts, birds, you know, giants. You know I mean? It was just, it didn't yeah. it just they didn't seem very interesting, which will lead into another thing that I have at the end. The minion we you talked about minion interaction underwhelming. On top of all this, there's also a market, right? There's some black chips. Right, so at the beginning of every round, we're going to put out three black chips because we need more stuff to do. Why? Because. And guess what? On top of all of that, there's something I already you know mentioned on all of the places where you build towers. There's now landmarks on all of those, and they all do something. They could be you know weird monsters or weird locations that do something because we need more rules. And then on top of that, there's dice that you roll throughout the game. You can get building upgrades that give you dice that you roll that give you even more abilities because we don't have enough abilities already. So at the end of the day, I was, again, I said when it just focused on the tower defense and when an event card completely didn't take that away from you, I thought it was kind of interesting and kind of engaging. But most of the time you end up managing the the minions and your heroes. That's what you spend the overwhelming majority of your time doing. And so it felt very much more like a MOBA game to me than a tower defense game, which is a shame because it's a bad MOBA game, but an okay tower defense game. And I was trying to wonder, what what about the MOBA genre were they trying to emulate? You know, the, the experience of playing it, other than just the trappings of having mindless minions. And I was comparing it to the other MOBA games that we, that we like. So in Guards of Atlantis, what you get are the very powerful heroes with their own set of abilities, and you get that sense of teamwork, because it's, it's one of the only MOBA games where it's a multiplayer game and you work in teams. You also have this trade-off between farming minions and killing other heroes, which is also a salient element of the MOBA genre. Rum and Bones does that as well, this trade-off between farming and killing. It also has this experience of managing different lanes, of the geography, of knowing where to push and when to push, making strategic withdrawals and making incursions in different lanes. It's one of the reasons why I love Rum and Bones. 
the only thing that Cloudspire really gets in terms of the experience for, for MOBA, for me anyway, is the last hit. Honestly, that's the only really salient bit. In MOBA games, typically, and this is one of those things that all modern MOBA games have been trying to get away from, you only get money if your hero murders the minion. You can do 90% of the damage to a minion, but you, in order to get the money reward, you need to do the last hit. In Cloudspire, this is represented in two different ways. Number one, you can strategically suicide against a neutral unit to deny your opponent some currency reward. This happened a couple of times where I had worked, worked, whittled down a unit, and then Walker looks at the board and says, huh, if I just go kill myself against this guy, you get nothing. Okay. And that wasn't particularly hot. And the other thing is, in order to upgrade your heroes, you need to do the last hit on a minion, and you want to really emphasize the last hits because then you don't have to worry about counterattacks because everything is super fragile in Cloudspire, which is fine. So really that calculus of getting the last hit of mathing out, okay, first this does two damage, then another two, aha, then I pounce. That part felt an awful lot like some of my experiences playing League of Legends. The bad experiences playing League of Legends, but it really did capture it. So in terms of what Cloudspire was going for, I don't know, but that was the most evocative element of the genre, and it really left me feeling cold. True. Well, the thing, what is it for? It was like, this is not a game you're going to bring to a gaming night and say, hey, let's play Cloudspire, right? This is something that you're going to have to find a group of people that want to play it over and over again. Because it wasn't like till a third game that I was actually having any fun whatsoever where you actually got to play the same faction, you know, third time in a row and you're actually understanding how it works. And it's like, okay, I'm going to go into this game with this particular strategy because I know how these buildings interact with these units and how these units interact with each other. And now I can actually have some sort of strategy and, and know what's going on in the game. The more experience I had with the faction, the more experience I had with the game system, the more it emphasized to me that in Cloudspire, it's all about these weird timing puzzles, about where the scrum is going to be, about who's going to deal that last hit. It reminded me a little bit about Space uh, of Space Alert, actually, but only as a good negative example. In Space Alert, when a minion shows up, you have to very quickly, under time pressure, say, okay, in turn five, it's going to be here, in turn six, it's going to move down here, in turn seven, we can finally shoot at it. Okay, that means I need to be at the station. Imagine doing that. But you don't know how fast the, sh the enemy is going to be, and you don't know when the enemy shows up. So by the time you end up engaging in your, your your automated plan, you realize that you needed to do the damage one turn earlier or one turn later, but you had no way to know that was the case. But I'm wondering if that's the point I have here. I'm wondering if they did that on purpose. Because imagine figuring all this out in your head. How long would that take? How much would that slow the game down? Right. So did they throw all this randomness in with, you know, the event cards, the stacking of the units so you don't know what's underneath, and so you don't know what's coming, you know, all of the opponent's abilities that there's no way you're going to know what's going to happen. And so the turn just, you know, starts up and they march towards each other. And once it goes, there's nothing you can do about it. And I wonder if they did all that just to make the game flow a little easier. Right. But f number one, to reiterate something I've said before, if it's all automated, why does it take the most time? Why are you spending most of your time doing this literally mindless automated stuff? And number two, if you compare it to the other successful MOBA games, in my estimation, things like Guards of Atlantis. In Guards of Atlantis, you manipulate your minions. You either boost them in a variety of ways. You can deploy additional ones in some cases. You move them out of the way to protect them, things like that. In Rum and Bones, you control where to deploy your minions, when to activate them, when to make the push, and whether to go after minions or various other things and farm them and blah, 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 all these other considerations. And so what you get is much more control and much more strategic and tactical decision-making trade-offs at a tenth of the manipulation time. And well, so... Look, I'm I, agreeing with you. I'm yeah. not saying this is a good thing. I'm just yeah. wondering if that's why they did it. Uh, if so, I, I don't understand why they would commit to those design goals. Honestly. I only have two more notes. I'm wondering what if it would be more interesting if it had an IP behind it, right? If there was, you know, if these factions were based off of something, would it get, would it give you more investment in them? Maybe it's just one thing I thought of today. And last but not least, Steven Universe. I assume you mean there. Of course, yeah. This is really the my least favorite type of game because I've talked about it before, where it's uh, Robo Rally and Steampunk Rally, where everyone has their head down, where your opponent is doing all of these things and there's no way you know what he's doing or whether he's doing it right. Not that he's doing it wrong what on these purpose. Do it, what, what they're doing. What they're doing right. Whether they're doing it they're doing it wrong on purpose or not. Maybe they're just missing reading a rule or they think it, these units interact with each other a certain way, but they don't. It's just one of these head down games that I, I really don't like. And that's why I would not play Cloudspire again. I also would not play Cloudspire again, especially because... As I said, there are these very successful MOBA games, and I'm looking forward to playing Guards of Atlantis again soon, after having already played 
rum and bones this weekend. I would also like to play too many bones again. And, and I will definitely want to play a solo game. I like I I, I kept Cloudspire because I wanted to play a solo game because we have a, a thread on the forum, a solo game thread on the forum that's blowing up. And I wanted, because I have very little experience with solo games. So I said, oh, I'll keep that and I'll try it. But then I thought, why would I play this when there's so many, you know, already tested and all these people have saying all these solo games are great, which I have on the shelf. Why wouldn't I play one of those instead of, you know, forcing myself through this experience of Cloudspire again? Well, that's going to do it for this week. Thanks very much for joining us for So Very Wrong About Games. If you'd like to get in touch with us, you can reach Walker via his email, justrolledadice at gmail.com. You can reach me, Mark Bigney, on Twitter, at the games you like. For more public discussion, you can find the So Very Wrong About Games Facebook page, or you can check out our Board Game Geek Guild, which is guild number 3236, and you can find us on Patreon. We read everything you send us, and we'll get back to you if we can. Thanks again for tuning in, and we hope to see you again soon. If you like the show, tell a friend. You've been listening to So Very Wrong About Games, produced by Michael Walker and edited by Mark Bigney. Special thanks goes to What Does It Eat for generously allowing us to use their most excellent song, FOS, as our theme. You can find them at whatdoesiteat.com. You can reach us by email at soverywrongaboutgames at gmail.com or on Twitter at sowronggames. Thanks very much. See you next time. And always, try to be right, but remember you are so very wrong. <laughs>